Are exhumations an African tradition? Does anybody want to answer that? Do you think, traditionally speaking, from ancient cultures, that it was okay to go and dig up bodies? Why not? Why, why can't I go and dig up your great-great-grandfather? It disturbs the ancestors. Ah. Do you hear the queen say that one more time, queen? It disturbs the uh, ancestors. It disturbs the ancestors. Now, you were supposed to... Yeah, there you, there you go. If we was to go to Africa, and we were supposed to speak to a griot, a griot is somebody who was commissioned to remember the culture, the history of the people, etc. They were good storytellers. And we're going to see a video of an African griot that's, been, that's inter, uh, interfacing with the white archaeologist that's coming to his community because he wants to get information on Mansa Musa. So he's speaking to this griot in this community. If you never heard of Mansa Musa, he was the one that was probably the richest man in Africa at one point in time, had all this gold, was making all these expeditions. Supposedly, he sailed off the continent. Nobody ever heard from him again. But now this white archaeologist, right, European archaeologist, going to this country in West Africa and <laughs> looking for uh, evidence of his existence. Because if you look, there's no archaeological record of this guy's existence, just oral tradition. So I want you to watch this video. And after you watch this video of this griot, this local griot who's highly respected, watch how he interfaces with the European archaeologist, all right? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Greetings, family. This is Devon Prospect of Kingdom Harbinger Ministries coming at you guys with a public service announcement. I want you guys to know that I have a GoFundMe at www.gofundme.com backslash K97M8W. And the purpose of this GoFundMe is to raise awareness in the Hebrew Israelite community about our comedic contemporary so that way we can have unbiased, objective scholarship so we can build and unify as a people, become part of history, click on a GoFundMe, and donate so you can be part of the movement. Narrow, overgrown path. The place I'm heading to is a little known ruin called Anbar. Rubikar has told me that it's very sacred and an important piece of the Malian Empire's history. Rubikar. Yes. Hunter. Hey, Sheikh. My <laughs> Welcome to Fofa. What is Fanfa? Well, Fanfa is a place where they used to bring the princes to hide them and to educate them. So Kanka Musa himself may have spent time here. Who knows? Maybe he might have been in this room. <laughs> Who knows? Right in here. Yes. Bubakar says that from the 13th century onwards, all the kings of the Malian Empire were trained here, including Kanka Musa. It's my first concrete link to the man himself. So this was a fort in a sense. Oh yes, it's a fortress. You see? Look at this wall here. We see the vestiges of, you know, that archaeological structure. Ah. And then you had, you know, layers of walls protecting the sanctuary. So has there been any archaeology done here then? Well, you know, it's not in our culture really to dig out our past. The way we dig up history is different from the way you do it uh, in the West. You know, you, 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 you dig sites, archaeologically speaking, you write documents, you write history down. Right. Here, we don't do that. Mm. This won't tell you anything more than what I just said. But then if you want I run into another taboo. It's forbidden to disturb sites as sacred as this one. Wow. It was hard enough just to get permission for me to visit. There's no way anybody would be allowed to dig here. Still, I can tell this was something special, even without formal archaeology. The oral history of Fan Fan is very detailed, and the fact that it's been kept secret tells me how important the site is. The griots may not tell me about Kanka Musa, but I'm getting closer to his story. So it's time to expand the search. I'm going to follow the money. Mm, I'm going to follow the money. Now, after watching this video, and there's plenty of these like that, I want to give a shout out to my brother Panahizi on Mekizadeh. He's the one who actually posted this video on his Facebook page. I've seen um, videos similar to this, but when I was trying to put the presentation up, I added this at the last minute, so I couldn't really get to come across those videos. But I know, I remember him putting the video and I asked him, and he gave me the link, so I cut the video up and I put it here. But if you can see, White archaeologists, when they go to West Africa or even other parts of Disney and Africa and they ask, can we dig? The local people there say, no, you're going to disturb our ancestors. So what they do is that they go to the head of state and they say, hey, here's uh, X amount of money. Can you let us dig? You see? It's not African condition. So when we make demands, we want to see bodies. The ideas of the 
debt being so valuable, it is clear why the Egyptians treated the deceased with respect. Are y'all following me so far? All right, move forward. Was exhumation in violation of ma'at? You know, ma'at is truth, order, justice, law. It's to keep things balanced. The opposite of it is called ishbet, and that was destruction, chaos, uh, lies, disorder, etc. When you study Kemet, you understand these terms. Now, you, there's a point in the pyramid text of the Old Kingdom when the ancient suits, when they died, when they got to the scales that were being weighed, their heart with the feather of ma'at, they would have confessions. The confession that they made was made to one of the 42 spirits that ruled on behalf of Osiris, and he had to show his allegiance to these spirits by reciting what he did not do in the afterlife so he could be cleared of any charges or any wrongdoing or any guilt, okay? So we want to know, if we pull up a body out the grave and disturb the dead, is this part of my act? Let's see. Now, this is uh, the petition that announces the 42 divine principle of Ma'at. You can look into the pyramid text of Unis, spell 125, and it'll list for you the different, um, um, the different uh, 42 principles of Ma'at. You also have Pepi, Teddy, all these old uh, kingdom uh, Nasus. All of them had these confessions, and it was all inscribed into what's called the pyramid text. All right, so uh, 125 of Unis, uh, also you have a nine, Seti, Pepi, Teddy, all of them also had it, so you can go back and look into it yourself. And if anybody wants any of the resources that I had used for these slides, just let me know and I can email it to you so you can go back and double check my work, okay? Now, the petitioner announces the 42 divine principles of my eye. In chapter 125 of the Papyrus of Anai, we find a petitioner led by Anuis, who I showed you earlier, and to do I am pronouncing his or her 42 affirmative declarations listed below from Budget's public domain. Anything that's in a public domain means that you can access it for free. Because it's been on the market for X amount of time, the publishing and the patent for it had already expired, and now it becomes open for the public's um, edification. All right? Of the 42 divine principle of mind, here we go. 38 says, I have not stolen what belongs to the god or goddess. Remember the suit? As he goes to the rites of passage, he becomes deified, and his twin influences the, 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 the regular uh, living, and then his spirit goes to what's called the realm of two ah, he becomes the ah, and his ah becomes a being of light. So he has to say, I have not stolen what belongs to the god. So if any of his ancestors were deified as a god, he was not to have stolen anything, not just from them. Greetings, family. This is Brother Divine Prospect. I want to thank everybody for watching Talk with the Titans. We want to thank you all for being our guest on tonight. I want to remind you guys to click in the description link below uh, and hit www.gofundme.com backslash K97M8W. This is me hosting a donation so that way the Hebrew Israelite community can accumulate knowledge on our comedic contemporary so we can build, unify, edify each other and become one. Peace, y'all but also anybody else that they consider to be a deified ancestor. 39 says, I have not stolen from or disrespected the deceased. We see that the reason why they kept things preserved is because they came to enjoy the afterlife. He's saying here that I have not disturbed or disrespected the deceased. We just saw, is it an African condition to exhume bodies? He says, I have not destroyed property belonging to gods or goddesses. It says, after the petition of testimony containing the 42 affirmative declarations, the weighing of the kind for truth, and the reading of the scales, it is said that the dua of Ma'at is a minister Ma'at, that the petitioner is deemed by the goddess Ma'at to be in substantial compliance with the 42 laws of Ma'at. The petitioner passes from Du'at to the field of reeds, which is Arus, where Osir sits as the final gatekeeper. This is by Vanessa Cross, JD, LLM. And again, you can just Google this or go to budget, uh, budget public domain and look at this in the papyrus of Benat. This is there's a reason why I'm showing you guys this, but we're gonna move forward and we're gonna get more understanding of it. Now, the pursuits of Kemet and yeah, precedence in biblical scripture to leave the tombs of patriarchs and prophets undisturbed. Is it in the Bible? Is it in Tanakh? Sure it is. 2 Kings 23 17 says, The king asks, What is that tombstone I see? The people of the city said, It marks the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things you have done to it. And the king says, leave it alone. Don't let anyone disturb his bones. So they spared his bones and those of the prophet who had come from Samaria. In the text itself, it gives you a precedence that somebody's revered as a prophet, do 
not touch their grave. And my aunt, when the Nasus went through their rites of passage in the afterlife, they said, I have not disrespected the deceased. You see how synonymous this is? So where is this idea at that we want to dig up dead bodies? We want to take artifacts. It's not from these cultures. These people didn't believe in that. The European does because he doesn't have any respect for that. That's not his ancestors. He just wants to rob it for Jews. Do you know how much money on the black market that you can make from all these excavations? Because before these things ended up in, in our museums, they were on the black market being sold for millions of dollars. If you're telling me that I can find some artifact with some little writing on it, and I can sell it on the black market for a million dollars, you don't think that's going to tell me that maybe I want to go and dig some bodies up, dig some artifacts up, because it's a lucrative business. That has nothing to do with trying to show what the history is. It's making money and using the name of science to cover it up. Y'all following me? Alright. Now, let's get into the tombs. You know, people say, hey, there's no Hebrew Israelite tombs. They don't exist. Where the burial sites at? Okay. Now I gotta get to the tombs. I mean, I'm giving you all these prophets. Anybody can go there today and see this. Do we have any evidence for the tomb of David? Of course we do. This is a panoramic view of where it's at. <laughs> This is the actual inside of the tomb itself. This is something that they put there to honor him, right? But let's see if there's some kind of information on that. Maybe it's not there. Maybe it's In the Biblical Archaeological Review, November, December 2012 issue, published at Cornell University website. It's T1. This is the designation for a burial site, just like you got KV 45, 62, 63 for the Valley of the Kings in ancient Kemet. You have T1 is the designation for the tombs in ancient Israel. A hundred years ago, Raymond Whale excavated this site in the city of David and believed it to be the Judite the king's tomb. Was he right? It's an article written by Jeffrey R. Zorn. 1 Kings 2 and 10 says that David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. So this article is investigating, is T1 David's tomb? Let's see. Right, a little bit of reading, but I'm gonna read it. According to the Book of Kings, most of David's immediate successors uh, down through Ahad, Ahaz, were also buried in the city of David. The city of David is a 12 acres, is well established as the earliest settlement of Jerusalem and the extent of the city in David's time down through the next 250 years. It is a relatively small ridge south of today's top Temple Mount. The city location was determined by the Gihon Spring, Jerusalem's only source of fresh water. The Gihon Spring also marked the commemoration of a remarkable 1,750-foot tunnel known as Hezekiah's Tunnel which the Bible references and is still there today. It says that carries, still carries the water of the spring to the other side of the city where it emptied into the Shalom uh, pool. How the two teams of tunnelers working from either end managed to meet is still somewhat of a mystery. An even greater mystery is the winding course of the tunnel. If it had been cut in a straight line from the spring to the pool, it would have been two thirds as long. One of the mysteries in the, is the connection, and the connection is the strange um, semicircular loop and the southern half of the tunnel. Why the tunnel is made this seemingly unnecessary loop? In 1887, the famous French diplomat, uh, Jerusalem savant and explorer Charles Clermont uh, Gagnon, uh, suggested that this loop was an effort by the tunnelers to avoid an inadvertent disturbance of the burial grounds of the Davidic kings above the tunnel. I suggest everybody read this article. This is a great in-depth article. I'll just give you snippets of it, but it gives you in-depth everything that they did to excavate this tomb. And making this suggestion, Claremont Bernal relied not only on general biblical descriptions placed in a royal necropolis in the city of David, but also more specific references in the book of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah returned from the Babylonian exile in the middle of the 5th century BCE, he rebuilt or repaired the walls of Jerusalem with various teams of workers. It is possible from the text to follow roughly the progress of the rebuilding of the wall. At one point, a team was assigned to repair the fountain gate or spring gate. This is presumably the gate by, the, um, by which the Gihon Spring is located. It says, um, the team also rebuilt the wall located near the Pool of the King's Garden, which is south of the Gihon Spring and adjacent to the graves or tombs of David as far as the artificial pool, Nehemiah 3 16. From the context of the passage, it is clear that the royal necropolis was located at the southern end of the city, possibly within a southern loop of Hezekiah's tunnel. To test Claremont Bernal's hypothesis, an archaeological excavation of the area was mounted in the early 20th century, funded by Baron Edmond de Rothschild and directed by the renowned French Egyptologist Raymond Weyel. The only tombs Weyel described with any specificity, indeed described at all, 
in his published reports are those he labeled T1 and T2, and there was also one called T3. So these are three tombs that they found. They are clearly the most prominent as well as the most interesting of, the, of his tombs that he discovered. Are T1 and T2 part of the royal necropolis, perhaps one of them, the tomb of King David himself? Let's take a closer look. Why should we expect 10th and 9th century BCE tombs to look like tombs from the latter part of the 8th century and later? Instead of looking for comparisons at the end of the Iron Ice Age, I'm sorry, the end of the Iron Age, when the kingdom of Judah had reached its full maturity, we should more sensibly look for parallels with the elite royal burials from the beginning of the Iron Age, 12th century BCE, and the end of the preceding Bronze Age. It says here, the most striking feature of these early royal tombs and elite tombs is their relative simplicity. These tombs, in fact, are so simple that they would not likely have been recognized as royal tombs save for the contents and architectural contents. It says here, for example, Elba and Syria, where we get the Ebla tablets, two royal tombs, the bronze two place dated to the 1800 BCE. The chambers lack symmetry and sophistication, only their contents and location below the palace signify the royal status. What does this mean? That means that these kings were not building these elaborate uh, burial places even before the kings of Judah was on the scene because they didn't want to make it obvious for people to go into their tombs and looted and rob. Okay? Now, at the conclusion of this, this is a lengthy article, but I'm going to jump down to the conclusion. The individuals including this, and this has been peer reviewed, I conclude that way out T1 and T2 are more than probable, or very probable, the remains of the tombs of the Davidic dynasty. One final point, when was the, why was David buried within the walls of Jerusalem? After all, Israelite laws concerning ritual purification dictated that anyone who touched the courts, which we read earlier, or even in grave, became ritually impure until the proper ceremony was undertaken in Numbers 19. One possibility is that David and his successors were worried about the plundering of their tombs and the desecration of their remains. It says here, uh, such a concern is well founded as attested in Amos 2 and 1, where God promises to punish the Moabites for burning the lime, burning to lime the bones of the kings of Yadam. Being buried inside the city added a layer of security, whether or not the burial site violated later Israelite law. Another possibility ties in with David's decision to make the Canaanite city of Jerusalem his capital. As a Bethlehemite, David was no doubt well acquainted with the trappings of power found in this nearby royal center. Since the area under his control included a mixed Israelite Canaanite population, he chose Jerusalem, at least in part, as a sense of authority that would symbolize his power in a way recognizable to his non-Israelite subjects. Being buried in Jerusalem in a tomb similar to those used by other Bronze Age elites, not his family tomb in Bethlehem, was another way to symbolize his royal status among his Canaanite subjects. In any event, the Bible is clear and placed in the royal necropolis within the city of David. The Bible makes a claim, archaeology confirms that claim, and we now have the tomb of King David. Simple as that. This right here is a legend of the actual uh, excavation site. T1 is right here, T2 is right here, T3 is right here. This is where King David was buried, right here. Right? This is actual uh, pictures of the actual cave itself where he was buried. Here's an image of the inside entering into the cave, and this is being actually into the cave. And when you lower it down, that's when you find uh, different artifacts in there signifying that a uh, person of royalty was buried in this location. Somebody had that. Let's say, for example, anybody familiar with Ancestry.com? Anybody saw that site before? Yeah. You can go on the site and you can actually uh, look through records that they have their pictures, etc., even burial sites of ancestors that may be related to you. Let's say, for example, that you look back, maybe let's say three generations, great grandfather, whoever, and you see your great grandfather was actually a mason who built all of these edifices. And let's say, in, in, let's say, someplace in in South Carolina, right? And he was known for this, right? So let's say, for example, you looked up ancestry.com, you got his name, you went to his burial site, you said, "Wow, this is interesting. He actually built that, right?" And then somebody says, "Hey, you know what? We have a local museum here, and we actually have his body here." Like what? you mean you have my great-grandfather's body in some museum? And you go to the museum, and you're looking at the museum, and you actually see them have either if he was preserved, if he was, if he was preserved, if he wasn't preserved, then maybe they have some bones. But then you start to see a picture of maybe your grandmother. Then you start to see a necklace, a ring that he may have had. You see all these things that are there in this museum. How would that make you feel? What if that was your, what if that was your grandfather? How would that make you feel? Without your permission, they're going to dig up an ancestor of, of yours because they want people to see who this person is and validate the fact that they made these edifices. T1 
to me, that would be disrespectful. I would protest that and you getting them out of it and you bury them back. That is a complete disrespect to a person's ancestors. You do not do that. That's not indigenous, it's not aboriginal to anybody in the land of Africa or the Middle East. They don't rock that way. We learned that archaeology is a European crime against indigenous people and a justification for robbing graves and desecrating our ancestors. The Europeans used the science and art of archaeology to rob graves. Simple as that. They had to be politically correct, so they called it science. But they stole stuff, and a lot of stuff was sold in the black market. Do you know how much these artifacts are worth in museums today? Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And how much people come day to day to watch this, the admission that they pay to watch, they make it making millions of dollars. This has nothing to do with venerating your ancestors. It's all about a lucrative business. Are, are y'all following me? What we should do is protest at every European American museum with these bodies and artifacts and demand that they put them back now that we have the information. If we want to do justice to our ancestors, we should go to each one of these museums and say thank you for the information, now put it back. Because you are not honoring our culture. This is not African culture, this is not Israeli culture, this is not culture of the people of this land, and we want you to put these bodies and artifacts back. You do not have the right to do this. Put it back. Nobody's giving you the authority to do this. If we want to show my order of justice, if you want to be righteous according to the scriptures, and we know that they have artifacts and they have bodies, we need to protest so they can put these things back. Our ancestors need to rest in peace. You know what rest in peace is? You go to a grave of your ancestors because rest in peace, leave me alone. Let my body stay where it's at. The moment you dig it up, they're no longer in peace. We should study the ancient civilizations like the Griot has said earlier in the video I showed you based on history, culture, architecture, language, and whatever we are allowed to excavate from the people. You see how that white archaeologist went into this West African town and he showed them the things that were there. But the moment he wanted to dig, no, you can't do that. But you can still study a person's history by just looking at the architecture. You know, looking at artifacts that you're allowed to, that people say it's okay. But it's not African to go dig up bodies, man. And then you want to put them in a museum where people pay to come and see them. If ancient Kemet was still here as a nation, they would not allow European archaeologists to come into their country and steal bodies or artifacts for science purposes. We know that Islam is in Palestine and they pretty much run and own most of the land that you see where their prophets are buried and they did that for a political reason because they understood the desecration that was taking place by the Europeans, by the Roman Catholic Church. They're preserving their ancestors. If ancient Kemet was read right now, and they was in this room with us, they were turned over in their graves to know that we allow their bodies to be posted in a museum. That we allow people to rob their graves. If they were here with a nation, they were war with the Europeans, talking about they want to come in here and do archaeology and exhumation, they would not allow that. So why we, and some of us who claim to be committed, who trace our lineage back to ancient Kemet, why are we not in the uproar? Why are we supporting the Europeans' excuse and justification to steal the bodies of our ancestors? Something needs to give you a lot of information because when people make these exaggerated claims, you have to investigate the intent and the motive behind what they're saying. So I, I and I'm looking in the camera, and I'm telling all my brothers that are in the committed community, the people that are telling us that we need to go and get bodies, and where's the body? I want to go see it in the museum, and I want to get the artifacts. That's not African. And we should protest that they take these bodies and artifacts and put it back so our ancestors can rest in peace. And this goes to everybody that's here and there. And I, oh, I'm actually, just I don't know if anybody knows about it, but I'm actually uh, doing a petition to submit to these museums to put these bodies back. Now, I have a Hebrew Israel ideology, but I put my people, my black people in their social, political, economic status before my ideology. But here's me being a Hebrew Israelite brother who has, who is in a process of creating a petition to get the bodies of comedic ancestors out to museums. Who's gonna side with me? And if they find any bodies of Hebrew Israelites or bones, like the two that I just showed you, a petition is going in the two, put it back. Put it back, let them rest in peace, put it back. So if y'all are really serious about your ancestors, then everybody here, I need your information, y'all put your name on the petition. If I get a thousand uh, uh, signatures on it, I can submit it to Congress and get it reviewed. And I can also go to London and submit it to museums there and get it reviewed so we can get these bodies back. These Europeans do not deserve the touch or know anything about our ancestors. 